Hello, and welcome back to Resilient Health Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Darren Ingalls. If you've been paying attention to the media at all in the last decade, you've seen so much information out there about CBD oil, cannabinoids, uh, medical cannabis. You know, it's just, it's all over the media, all over the news. And I think there's a lot of confusion and I'll say even misunderstanding about cannabis and cannabinoids. So you're going to really enjoy my guest today. I'm also, I'm enjoying my guest today because we're actually friends. <laughs> so my guest is Steve Ottersberg. He is a master, uh, has a master's degree in chemistry, biochemistry, and he's worked in academia most of his life. He actually ran a lab in Colorado for several years, measuring quality of cannabis and looking for toxins and toxicants. So he really knows a lot about this subject. So I really want to be able to talk about, you know, cannabis, cannabinoids, CBD. Uh, so, Steve, you know, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolute honor, Dr. Ingalls. Can I call you Darren? You can... <laughs> My mother calls me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> no, I, I think maybe let's just start off talking a little bit about, you know, cannabinoids as a whole. Because again, people hear about CBD, they hear about THC, which are types of cannabinoids. But maybe you can just share a little bit about, you know, what are these as a group? So number one, we need to, we need to classify these cannabinoids. CBD and THC are phytocannabinoids. And the reason I think that it's important that we, that we distinguish this is because the crazy thing about the history of cannabinoids is we discovered cannabinoids before we even knew that the human body had an endocannabinoid system. And so when you look back in history, Raphael Mokulam, who was considered the father, father of cannabis chemistry from Israel, I think it was in 1963, he first isolated and characterized THC. And at that time, all we knew was that this plant, cannabis plant that produced THC had psychoactive properties, and that's what we call high from, you know, getting high from cannabis is the psychoactive properties of this phytocannabinoid that we call tetrahydrocannabinol. So that's what we all associate with the high of marijuana. And marijuana is misnamed. There's a whole lot of political history with that that we probably don't even want to get into today. But marijuana is, is its, its Latin classification is cannabis sativa. There are subclassifications of cannabis sativa. There's cannabis sativa indica, cannabis sativa um, ruderalis, and there's there's you know a whole family of cannabis plants. Of those cannabis sativa varieties, is hemp. And hemp, as you know, if you remember the history of of hemp, it was originally grown for fiber. And because it's a relative of what we refer to as the marijuana plant, it also produces cannabinoids. And the distinguishing factor between marijuana and hemp is that marijuana has been selectively bred by the black market to produce massive amounts of THC today relative to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. And this is why this is why people have, you know, have this idea, these old stoners, you know, are talking about back in the day they could smoke a joint all by themselves, because back then it's like 12% THC. And today we're talking, you know, 18% for it to even get on the legal market. I mean, it's not really like that. But that's how, that's the perception. Yeah. And when we think about what hemp is, hemp was, hemp was a major part of World War I and World War II. It was a strategic plant back then because that's what many of the, you know, the canvas bags, the canvas tents, the ropes, and all, a lot of the, the gear that was used in World War I and World War II was derived from hemp fiber. And hemp is a major source of CBD. And so back to your original question, THC and CBD are phytocannabinoids that, you know, in media, you're going to hear, and the FDA is starting to crack down on this. The FDA is kind of on a witch hunt for cannabis companies that are making outrageous health claims about their products. And what you're going to hear is that cannabis products cure everything. <laughs> and... I want you, I'm on, I want to set the record straight. Cannabis products have medicinal benefit and they don't cure everything and they don't function the same way in everybody's body. We're all biochemically individual. And as you know, being a doctor, every patient's going to respond differently to every therapy. Right. Well, talk a little bit about cannabinoid receptors. You know, you alluded earlier in the, you know, the research back in the 60s, you know, we discovered that we've got these receptors in our brain and our body yep. for cannabinoids. You know, like I said, this whole, we call endocannabinoid system. 
yep. is e extremely intricate and complex. So, you know, maybe talk a little bit about what that system is and, and why is it there? Well, typically when we have receptors in our body, it's because our body can produce a molecule to fill the receptor. It's pretty, it's, you know, it's kind of, and this was, this was the historical thing is we found cannabis first. We discovered THC in cannabis. Then we just discovered CBD. Then we discovered we have receptors to it. And then people started to think, oh, well, do we produce an endogenous cannabinoid to bind to those receptors? And so it wasn't until the nineties that we actually discovered that we produce molecules in our body that that actually bind to the, the cannabis receptors. Yeah. So, you know, when we talk about these different cannabinoids, I, again, I think, you know, CBD, THC are the ones that get the most uh, press, but in reality, there's, there's a bunch of them. There's CBN, yep. CBG, there's all these different cannabinoids that seem to all have different health effects, right? Yep. Yeah. And here's the thing. You have to remember that, that plants, and here's the interesting thing about cannabis is it's the only plant that produces these compounds. And these compounds aren't cheap for them to produce. And it's believed that these, the cannabis plant is producing cannabinoids as sunscreen for the female flower. And so when you hear people talk about buds, the bud is the female flower and the female flower produces more cannabinoids than the male does. And part of the, it's believed that part of the motivation of the plant to produce these cannabinoids is sunscreen to protect the DNA in their ovum. And the male produces pollen, the pollen pollinates the ovum. And, and, you know, after that, the, the female flower turns into seed production and the cannabinoids basically go away. So in the life cycle of the plant, it's a protective mechanism. The other thing you have to remember about the, this plant is all plants in the plant kingdom produce terpenoids. And the terpenoids are important to the plant because they are antifungal. They protect from um, predation. The and so when you think about terpenoids, the terpenoids are like limonene is, is a compound produced by citrus to protect it from predation. Um, linalool is a terpenoid that's produced by lavender that's believed to be both attractive to pollinators, but it's also believed to have antifungal properties in the plant. And so when you think about the, the, the production of cannabinoids and terpenoids, this is part of the plant's life cycle. The plant is producing these molecules to protect and preserve its, its offspring in the terms of, of the DNA that it's passing along in its seeds, but it's also producing the terpenoids to, to bring in the pollinators to make sure that the, the pollen coming from the male gets to the female and to, you know, to protect itself from predation and from disease. Mother Nature's just freaking brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it just, it just turns out coincidentally that these cannabinoids bind to a system that we have in our body known as the endocannabinoid system. And there, this is something that is shared by a large number of organisms. I got to do a talk on the, the uh, archaeological genetics. I don't think that's the correct term. That, that, that's what I call it, at Ancestral Health Symposium. And it's, there's some really interesting you know, endocannabinoid traits that go, that are prehistoric. I mean, the, the, the elephant shark is one of the most, the most evolutionarily preserved species that's still alive on the planet today. And the elephant shark has an endocannabinoid system, you know, and there's, there's mushrooms that produce endocannabinoids. And there are also organisms like the hydra, the, the hydra is a simple, you know, it's not a single cell, but it's a simple small organism that actually has uh, cannabinoid receptors, but it doesn't produce its own endocannabinoids. So there is some interesting species to species variation, but most mammals, you know, have an endocannabinoid system and it's, it's pretty highly conserved from species to species. Well, let's talk specifically about CBD. When, you know, you take a CBD product out there, you know, what is it kind of chemically doing to our brains? I think that's where most people are feeling. Yeah. 
Well, here's one of the things that I, I want to bring clarity to the discussion about CBD, because there's a lot of people that say that CBD is non-psychoactive. And that's not true. We call we say that THC is psychoactive, and everybody gets that THC is psychoactive. But when we say psychoactive, we're not describing that THC is euphoric. That is its psychoactivity. It gets right. you high, and you know the medical term for that is it's, it's euphoric. CBD is psychoactive, and the classification of its psychoactivity is it's an anxiolytic meaning that it's, it's an anti-anxiety agent. So it's generally calming to the central nervous system. And in general, what, what the function is of the endocannabinoid system is it's a retrograde feedback modulation system of the central nervous system. And I know that, that for the layperson, that's a, you know, that's a really big term. And what it means is Retrograde signaling is feedback signaling. So it's kind of like a sensor on the central nervous system that feeds back, you know, too much neurotransmission or too little neurotransmission. There's, and it, it really is involved in both. It's kind of like the anti-lock brakes of the central nervous system. It keeps it from speeding up too fast or slowing down too fast. I mean, as you know, some, some neurological conditions aren't necessarily that, that there's an absence of neurotransmission, but neurotransmission is either modulated too high or too low. And the purpose of the endocannabinoid system is really to prevent over-modulation or under-modulation of neurotransmission. And so you'll hear neuro, you know, neuroscientists talk about the function of the endocannabinoid system is either tonic or phasic, meaning that it's going to modify massive changes in amplitude of transmission, or it's going to, to, to modify massive changes in the frequency of neurotransmission. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like in, in radio speak, they would call it a band pass filter. It helps filter out the static in the signals of our central nervous system. And so, you know, when you really come down to it, it's just kind of like fine tuning the signal quality of neurotransmission. And so when, and that's in the central nervous system, but overall, we know that CB1 receptors are mostly expressed in the central nervous system, but CB2 receptors are expressed all over the body. And especially of importance with CB2 receptors is in the GI tract and the immune system. And so when you think about their, their function, CB2, CB2 receptors are kind of really driven towards homeostasis. Like in the, in the GI tract, one of the things that the cannabinoid receptors do is they influence the tone of GI contraction. And this is why for, for people with cancer or people with things like irritable bowel syndrome, if there is over spasticity, of the, the GI tract, it could lead to diarrhea just from, from the muscle tone being too spastic in nature. Well, you know, with, with, with um, the drug, there's, there are two um, drugs that have been approved by the FDA that are, are from cannabis. So GW Pharmaceutical in, in uh, the UK has gotten approval for Sativex and Epidolex. And so, as you know, Sativex is approved for muscle spasticity with MS and Epidolex is, is approved for, um, seizures, uh, specific type of seizures in children. Yeah, no, I, it's, it's, uh, it's one of these things where I think, you know, there's so much broad application of what CBD is useful for clinically. You know, you mentioned the anxiety effect and certainly we use it for that. I've seen it help people improve their quality of sleep. I've yep. seen it, yeah, for helping reduce muscle spasticity. In fact, I have a colleague uh, who's a doctor, and her husband has ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and spasticity, like MS, is a major problem. And she was giving him massive doses of CBD without THC because he, yep. he didn't tolerate THC at all. But at high doses of CBD, it really got rid of his muscle spasms. It yeah. was better than any drug that he had tried, you know, before. So, you know, I, 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 I like CBD a lot because, again, we, we do see a lot of good clinical effect. Uh, very, really 
quite few side effects. My experience with it is that sometimes it just doesn't work. It just doesn't do what we want it to do, even as we increase the dose. But I have very few people that feel like they had an adverse side effect. Yeah. And that's the most common thing I've heard, you know, in, in terms of most people tolerate CBD really well. I think I have met one person in my life that, that developed anxiety from CBD. And I have, you know, I have, I have either coached, you know, directly with, with patients through, you know, my, you know, the, the audience probably doesn't know that my wife is a naturopathic oncologist. And so that's one of the capacities that I serve, um, in my relationship with cannabis is I, I help cancer patients to determine a, a good product for them, for their journey with cancer and how cannabis can help them. And in my eyes, this is one of the strengths of cannabis is in the cancer world because there are so few things in the toolbox of the oncologist that can help with conditions like cachexia. And so for your patients that are not medically oriented, cachexia is metabolic wasting. And for cancer patients that are in a metabolic wasting syndrome state, they typically don't have an appetite. Patients that are taking, um, you know, that are, that are, are on chemotherapy or radiation, they typically don't have an appetite. And there's so few tools in the toolbox of modern oncology that can improve appetite without weird side effects. There are some appetite, you know, um, appetite uh, influencing drugs, but not many of them are that effective. And the ones that are available don't, you know, they kind of work sometimes, right? But, you know, mostly across the board, if you were to say, what is the biggest strength of, of cannabis products? I think in the cancer world, the, the appetite and, um, and, um, the ability to reduce nausea, the anti-emetic effect of THC and CBD has some of this effect. I don't think that it's as strong as THC, but the anti-emetic effect, the ability to reduce nausea, I don't think that there is a, a pharmaceutical agent that comes close to, you know, those two things. There's, there's a lot of, of studies that, that show that, that CBD and THC both are, in, are, are good tools for some types of pain, you know, neuropathic pain that responds to things like neurotin and to opiates, that type of pain can be effectively managed with some, some, some THC. And the problem with THC is that not everybody can tolerate it. Yeah. And the other, the other part of, of, and this is true for, for THC and CBD is the other part of this is not every, you know, and this is true of every therapy, not everybody responds the same. And it can be difficult for clinical practitioners to evaluate what type of cannabis product is going to be appropriate for what patient. And we do, we are getting some handle on how genetic testing can influence that. Um, so, you know, if you, if you had your 23andMe test ran or you have a DNA test ran, by companies like Nutrition Genome or the DNA company um, or Endocana Health. There's a handful of companies out there that are, that are reporting the genes related to cannabis response. One of them is FAH, um, fatty acid amethydrolase. Fatty acid amethydrolase is the enzyme in our central nervous system that breaks down our endocannabinoid known as anandamide and this this endocannabinoid let's go let's jump into the endocannabinoids real quick i think this is one of the things that i think is is really not fully understood in the lay public and i think that this is not really communicated well within the cannabis industry at least by people that are selling cbd and thc i think that there's there's not a really effective message about how the endocannabinoid system influences the response to cannabis products. And so when you think about what the endocannabinoids are, these are molecules that are derived from our essential fatty acids. And there's a French researcher by the name of Oliver Manzoni that's done a lot of the, the foundational research in mice that give us our basic understanding of the endocannabinoid system. And one of the primary aha moments that I had in, you know, my academic journey with the endocannabinoid system is 
Oliver Manzoni published a study in 2011, and the study looked at mice. And they what they did is they they had a mouse population and they fed them an omega-3 fatty acid deficient diet. And in mice, this nutritional omega-3 deficiency abolished endocannabinoid mediated neural. Oh my God, how did I lose this word? <laughs> neuroplasticity. See, this is the problem. If I, if I had better neuroplasticity, I, that word would have been there, right? And I don't think you have to, I don't think you have to be a medical expert to know that neuroplasticity is good, right? You know, neuroplasticity is what we need to maintain neural, normal neurological function. And it, neuroplasticity is one of those things that we just normally lose as we get older. Maybe my age is showing a little bit today because I couldn't say neuroplasticity. <laughs> <laughs> and Oliver Manzoni's research is pointing to a link between our endocannabinoid system, the type of fat that we get in our diet, and how, how the endocannabinoid system influences whether we have neuroplasticity or not. And so I think that this is, this is what, le what leads me to say that omega-3 fatty acids are probably the most influential factor in how you're going to respond to cannabis products. Because remember, CBD and THC are monkeying with your normal endocannabinoid function. If your normal endo endocannabinoid function is not tuned in properly because you're getting too many omega-6s and not enough omega-3s, you're probably not going to have an optimal response to cannabis. Right. And there's, there's some anecdotal evidence. There's, you know, on some of the, the cannabis forums on the internet, you know, people, it, I call them stoner myths, but I think that, I think that there's truth to this. I mean, there's, here's, here's one of the things about the cannabis industry is I kind of, I kind of, you know, look at the cannabis industry, kind of like how I look at bodybuilders. Bodybuilders taught us most of what we know about about amino acid biochemistry today, right? You know, when you look back at amino acid research, largely amino acid research in the past 20 to 30 years has been driven by what the bodybuilders are doing, you know, behind the scenes because they're just going to experiment on themselves. They don't know what the outcome is. As long as they can get jacked, they're going to try anything. And I appreciate that because I love learning from, from, these, these people that are experimenting on themselves. And this is kind of how I view the cannabis industry. I mean, people in the cannabis industry on online forums are saying, if you take DHA fish oil supplements on a regular basis, you limit your omega-6 intake in your diet, you're going to get more pleasant, creative highs from different strains of cannabis. And I think that in general, that because of the link between inflammation and neurological degradative diseases and the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Because remember that, you know this, Darren, that the other important thing with omega-6s and omega-3s is they are the precursors to prostaglandins, leukotrienes, thromboxanes, and where do these molecules, if you're not a medical professional, the molecules that I just rattled off to Darren, these are the backbone of what we call the eicosanoid system. And the eicosanoid system is what the target is for aspirin, ibuprofen, and the other class of drugs. That, you know, These are from the class of drugs that we call NSAIDs. And NSAIDs are a multi-billion dollar market. And I think that is pretty common knowledge to everybody in the world today that low dose aspirin is beneficial for reduction of cardiovascular risk, right? And why is that? And it's, it's because it directly inhibits blood clotting that's driven by thromboxanes. Well, where do thromboxanes come from? Thromboxanes come from arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a product of omega-6 fatty acids. And so when you think about it, we have this multi-billion dollar industry on the tails of this massive consumption of omega-6 fatty acids following World War II. You know, before World War II, we didn't consume the amount of corn oil, soy oil, and canola oil that we consume today. 
And when you look at the, the historical ramp of cardiovascular disease, you see this massive ramp up of cardiovascular disease as animal fat consumption is dropping off. So you can't point the picture at animal fat consumption because animal fat consumption after wool, you know, doesn't follow that same trend. Animal fat consumption has been dropping consistently since World War II. So when you think, you know, back to the endocannabinoid system, I think the bottom line for, you know, for a consumer, a new consumer of cannabis is I think that one of the most important things that you can do to ensure that you're going to have a positive response to CBD or THC is limit your omega-6 fatty acid intake and take DHA supplements. And I think, you know, when you hear people um, like, oh my God, who wrote Grain Brain? Perlmutter. Uh, David Perlmutter. Yeah. yeah. When you hear people like him talk about DHA as the most important supplement in terms of prevention of neurological de degenerative diseases. I think that d just taking DHA is probably a good idea for everybody. And here's one of the crazy other things about this. One of the, the, um, one of the, the late discovered uh, endocannabinoids, remember that these are derived from essential fatty acids. So when you take DHA, DHA can become an endocannabinoid. When the cannabinoid that's derived from DHA was first discovered, they gave it the nickname synaptamide. And they gave it the nickname synaptamide because this DHA derivative endocannabinoid stimulated synaptogenesis in experimental models. Do you know anybody that doesn't need synaptogenesis? <laughs> nope. Yep. I think in, for those of you that are not medical professionals listening to this, what I just asked Darren, is there anybody that doesn't need to take DHA? And that I think that this is like the basis of protection of neurological function. I mean, synaptogenesis is the ability to regenerate our, our, you know, basic structure of our central nervous system. Well, I think that's one of the things I appreciate about a lot of the cannabinoids too, is that they also have this anti-inflammatory effect. Yep. So, you know, again, how many people out there are struggling with inflammation, whether it's inflammation of the brain, inflammation of the gut, you yep. know, this is the driving force behind so much chronic illness. And, you know, we do a lot of things obviously to mitigate that, but again, this is just another tool in our box that we can potentially use to control that. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting. You know, one of the, the most popular drugs in Europe, we don't use it here in the U.S., controls seizures, is two milligrams of THC and two milligrams of CBD. And Yeah, and why don't we use that regularly here in the U.S.? Well, you know, again, you talked about the politics of cannabis. I think that's where <laughs> we're stuck. You know, I mean, federally, yeah. you know, cannabis products are still, you know, basically illegal. So, or at least THC products are. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I tend to focus more on the other cannabinoids that don't contain THC because, again, a lot of people don't want that euphoric effect. Uh, yep. We don't necessarily need that for the purposes that we're using it for. Again, if we're using it for anxiety, we're using it for sleep. You know, I treat a lot of kids with autism, and I've always been impressed on how well a lot of these kids respond to CBD uh, by itself uh, yeah. just to help, you know, balance them out help control some of the behaviors, help them sleep better. I do have some kids that do use products that contain THC, particularly if they're having very aggressive behavior. It does seem to, you know, balance them out a little bit. And again, relative to putting a child on Risperdal, Haldol, these like really hardcore psychoactive drugs, uh, it's certainly a much safer option. I mean, clearly, you know, we're always looking for, you know, the root cause of why, you know, they have these behaviors in the first place. But in the meantime, you know, some kids get to be very aggressive. They hurt themselves. They hurt other people. And we need to put the fire out. And so, again, this is just another another good option to, you know, potentially mitigate that. So, you know, for people who are, you know, maybe they've never tried uh, like CBD in particular, you know, what should they be looking for? Again, every, you know, Joe, especially like here in California, Colorado states where cannabis is legal, you know, you've got a pot shop on every corner, you know, as a consumer, how do you know what product's good? What should you be looking out for to know if you're getting a good quality product? 
Well, that's a great question. And this is, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this is, this is what prompted me to get into the cannabis industry is because I was so passionate about, you know, formulation of products and, 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 um, quality control. And I'm a member of an organization called AOAC. AOAC is the American, um, Sure goes my neuroplasticity again. It must be Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> the The reason is that AOAC historically has changed its name. It's been around since you know for for over a hundred years now. And AOAC is the org is an all volunteer organization of chemists, and we're the people that develop the methods methodology of testing for foods and food supplements and uh, botanical products. So when you look at a label on a food product that says this product contains five milligrams of niacin, the testing method for how that five milligrams of niacin was quantified is developed by AOAC and it's, a, it's global. So this is the global standard for food testing for identity and safety and purity. And so when you are looking for a product, number one, if you can find a product that has a GMP label on it, that is the, the gold standard. GMP is a voluntary system of auditing. And what a GMP label means is that the manufacturer has a third party auditing company come in periodically and audit their manufacturing practices for safety and in, in this is what gives manufacturers an ability to see their blind spots. You know, simple things like in a GMP audit, they're going to audit where are the hand washing stations in this facility. It goes far beyond that, but that's the fundamental. So GMP is the first thing to look for. If you can find a product that's GMP, gold standard. In, 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 in states that have licensing, there are third-party audited testing labs that have been set up to test cannabis products. So the, if you can't find GMP, ask for products that have quality and safety testing. And what you want to know about those products is, are they tested for mold? Are they tested for mold toxins? Are they tested for residual solvents if they have extract, you know, if they have a solvent-based extraction involved? in their processing? Are they tested for pesticides? And so those are the primary things that you should ask for when purchasing a cannabis product and a reputable retailer should be able to tell you, you know, with confidence whether the product is tested or not. If you're in a licensed state and you go to a dispensary, by law, that dispensary has to be able to provide you with testing data if you ask for it. Oh, and that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, this is the this is one of the things that the that most states, and I can speak for sure about Colorado and California because I feel like they set the standard for setting the bar high for quality control standards in cannabis testing. And so, if you go to a licensed dispensary in the state of California or the state of Colorado, and there's other states that have done really good, but these are the two that I'm the most familiar with. But in California and Colorado, when you go to those, to, those, to those dispensaries that are state licensed, all of their products are tested for mold. They're all tested for mold toxins. They're all tested for residual solvents. They're tested for heavy metals, and they're tested for pesticides. And in addition to that, they're going to, to be required to test for the levels of THC, CBD, and any other cannabinoids that they state a quantity claim on their label. And so when you think about, you asked earlier about all the other cannabinoids. So there's CBG. CBG is the mother of all cannabinoids. This is the first thing that the plant produces is CBG. And then from CBG, all of the other cannabinoids are produced in the plant. When you purchase a THC or CBD product, you should have on the label the quantity of THC acid and the quantity of THC. And the reason is because when you purchase a raw THC product, most of that THC is going to be in the form of THC acid. And THC acid maintains most of the physiological beneficial property of, of THC, but it's believed that THC acid is about four times less psychoactive than THC. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And so for people that want the medical benefit of THC that don't want the high, look for THC acid products. They're becoming more and more available in, in some of the sophisticated cannabis markets. And the THC acid is the raw form of THC in the plant. And this is why, this is why we smoke it or why, why we make brownies. Because you can eat the raw plant, you can eat raw plant extracts, but if it's raw, the THC is mostly going to be in the form of THC acid and provides very little psychoactivity. Interesting. Well, uh, I know, again, being in California, <laughs> there's just there's so many different products. I know, again, as a consumer, again, if you walk in any pot shop, it's... It's the buffet of, you know, liquids yeah. and gummies and yeah. and vape. And, you know, I mean, I've generally, you know, from a health standpoint, advise people not to smoke it, not to vape it, just because although it gets into your system very quickly, uh, you know, there is a potential to damage your lungs if you are a regular user. Uh, but with edibles, obviously, there's a lag time from the time you ingest it, and everyone's metabolism is different. It might hit you in 30 minutes. It might not hit you for a few hours. So people have to kind of play around with edibles to see how long it takes for their body to react. Um, so, you know, it, they're just all different. Just be aware that if you're using any kind of canvas product, you may have to find that you have to try different, different products, different amounts. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm always in the camp of start small. It's always easy to add more if you need it. <laughs> some people where you know, even, you know, you know, three, four, five milligrams of CBD provides a clinical benefit. Or if we're yeah. using a CBD product, two milligrams is enough. You know, you yeah. don't necessarily have to get it. And, and even if you're using a THC product, I mean, again, there is a threshold. And I think you had shared with you at one point, it's about 10 milligrams, right? That, yeah. below, that most people don't get the euphoric effect. So you can still get the health benefit without necessarily getting high. And yeah. so if you still need to function during the day and don't want to fall asleep and, you know, plow through bags of Doritos, then, you know, there's a way to balance it in a way, you know, so that you get the clinical benefit without necessarily that, that, that effect. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to reiterate, if you are new to cannabis and you're going to try edibles, start low and go slow. I mean, if the bud tender tells you that you can take 10 milligrams and you're going to be fine, remember that that bud tender's probably been smoking massive amounts of cannabis since they were 10 years old yeah. and they have developed a tolerance. And this is one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand is when you get advice from a seasoned user, that's somebody who has downregulated their cannabinoid receptors. And the, the, this is why I'm a big proponent of microdosing. Yeah. Because if you're taking, you know, normal, normally people take around 10 milligrams of THC to hit that, that psychoactive threshold. And if you take one to two milligrams or less, you can take it more frequently and microdosing can actually upregulate your cannabinoid receptors. And if you are using cannabis on, for chronic pain, know that you're going to have, you're going to develop a tolerance and you need to take a tolerance break. Every 30 days, you should take a four day tolerance break so that you can re express your cannabinoid receptors. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Well, uh, you know, I, I think we're running a little long on time here. So I, I think I'd love to have you back where we maybe can talk more specifically about some of the THC products. Cause again, I, I know that's a little bit different and it's kind of its own little animal into itself, but yeah. And if you're interested in trying, you know, particularly a CBD product, uh, again, there's a lot of really great companies, as you mentioned, that have clean products. There are no solvents, no pesticides. They're basically organic. Uh, there's a company that I use a lot of called Canavest or CV Sciences. Yep. That's um, one of my first recommendations. They've been I around like for a them. long time. They've been around a long time. You know, their farm is in Holland. I, they're not certified organic, but in speaking with them, they don't use any pesticides or herbicides on their product. Uh, and a lot of the research on CBD is their product. They provided it for the research. So yep. I always like using the actual substance that's been used in the, the clinical research. 
Um, so it's been one of my go-to uh, CBD products out there. But Steve, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today to kind of go through it. I know it's really complex and I know you broke it down really well for folks. So again, I just really appreciate you being here and sharing that information with everybody. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolute honor. Yeah, and it, this is the thing with cannabis is there's no simple answers. There's no straightforward. It's a complex system. It's a complex plant. And I unfortunately tend to be long-winded about it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks again. Well, I look forward to having you back where we can talk about it more. My pleasure. Thank you.